Welcome to uh, this special session. Um, towards the end of the day, it's, it's true, but actually we save the best to last. Uh, and Sir Anthony Selden, very distinguished historian, writer of many biographies uh, of uh, prime ministers. There's another one going to be finished tomorrow night, we hear. Um, and uh, as on somebody you might recognize from his, his Christian name, um, Boris. And then uh, there are... <laughs> Uh, a whole host of fascinating books about uh, Number 10 Downing Street and uh, other uh, notable figures of the past. Real pleasure to have you with us, Anthony. Thank you so much. But what we're talking about today is this, I think, remarkable book. Um, and I commend it very strongly to you. It's still in hardback, I'm afraid, but at £20, it's a snip. Um, so uh, do feel free to get it at the end, uh, where Anthony, I'm sure, will, will be prepared to sign the multiple, multiple copies we have of it. Um, but what it does is, is tell an extraordinarily rich story um, of tragedy and, um, and valour, of courage and of faith and of um, desperate times and so on. But the, the, the wonderful thing is that it's a story of the Western Front way um, which is a way that is being uh, opened up so that it's a 1,000 kilometres from Switzerland to the coast that is the way of the Western Front of the First World War. Um, and in walking that, Anthony, dare I say, 68 years old, um, did a remarkable job and yet was bringing with him his own story, which was one of the loss of uh, Joanna, his, his beloved first wife, um, which was the, uh, a story of having, I don't know if you'd say, lost confidence at, uh, at, at the University of Buckingham, but anyway, having left the job um, and having lost the house that went with it and so on. So there's a lot of lostness in that. Uh, and here was um, Anthony doing this, this walk. A remarkable story, and the way these intertwine, um, I have found uh, immensely rich. But um, it's a story of discovery as well. And, uh, and we hear that too, but of, of considerable... I mean, I'm 74, so I can't imagine even thinking of doing this walk a 1,000 kilometres. I want to ask you straight away... No, I'm in the, I'm in the chair at the moment, <laughs> Um So I want to, to ask you about the, the, just the origins of this uh, rich book. Um, and it's, it rests with a, um, the dream of Douglas Gillespie. So just tell us about how this... This book, this idea, this, uh, this whole concept came about. Well, thank you very much indeed, John. And can I just say at the beginning, it is an absolute thrill and honour to be here and to be being quizzed by uh, John, who uh, I knew when he was Bishop at Oxford uh, and was much revered um, at that time. So this is a thrill. And what I was going to say then is 74, pa, pa. <laughs> uh, uh, this summer I was going to be picking up from Kilometre Zero, which is in Switzerland, where this book finishes, on my way walking to Ukraine. And I was going to be walking uh, this summer to Auschwitz for a book called The Path to Light, mm. finding light on the way rather than we know all the darkness. Where was the light? And the light is often around, actually I would say always around faith. Um, I can't do that because, because as might come out I've, this week, something happened to my life. Um, but look, this is a Winchester story. Uh, this is, uh, who here lives in or near Winchester? Um, so, uh, good. Um, you can come to the first front of the queue uh, when we have the signing at the end <laughs> um, and have the special gold laminated copies of the book. Um, it starts in Winchester because there was a young man uh, called Douglas Gillespie. And he was at Winchester College. His family lived up in Scotland. And he, uh, when war came, he was very gifted, really seriously gifted. He wanted to go and have a life in politics. He wanted to build a better world. Uh, his last words that he... Uh, read in his mortal life were from Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, the book was found open in his possessions before he went over the top uh, and was profoundly influenced by being at Winchester uh, and 
uh, I've been there, and they are laying out uh, their own version of the Via uh, Sacra, the, this pathway in their grounds. And he most unusually, I mean, it's astonishing this, of the 15 or so million who combatants in the uh, First uh, World War, um, he had a vision. Uh, and he wrote the vision to his head at Winchester College. And he was thinking, no doubt, of his brother, who had been killed, uh, fighting very close by where he was uh, stationed, uh, in a part of the Western Front, just into France, just south of Armentier, which is the border uh, town in between France and Belgium on the Western Front. And his brother, Tom, was killed, and it etched very deeply into him. And his diaries are full of trying to find places where Tom had been in the last weeks of his life, chateaus behind the front line and estaminet and other places he might have visited and, and uh, rivers or canals in which he might have fished were not in the front line. And he wrote this letter, one version to his parents uh, up in Linlithgow, uh, and one to his headmaster. And the vision was, um, don't worry, not all my answers will be this uh, long, uh, starting answer. Um, he said uh, that if I survive this war, unlike my brother who didn't, if I survive this war, I want to see created uh, a permanent pathway along no man's land uh, from the Vosges Mountains in the east by Switzerland all the way up to the North Sea, tree-shaded, a Via Sacra, but not a Via Dolorosa. And I would like every man, woman, and child in Western Europe to walk along this tree-shaded Via Sacra as a reminder, as a reminder of where war leads from the silent witnesses on both sides. And you know who the silent witnesses are, but that idea also of both sides. It was a very inclusive vision. Before the war, he'd been very influenced by a historian, Arnold Toynbee, uh, grandfather of, um, uh, of uh, Polly Toynbee, who writes in The Guardian, uh, and uh, uh, who was the daughter of Philip Toynbee, who wrote a wonderful book about walking to Chartres. Um, and uh, that's it, you know? And, and, and I just had that uh, moment when I read that letter when writing another book about blah, blah, blah. It was about uh, public schools and the Great War. Just had a sense then that this was something. One of those moments we all have in our lives where you just know that something is about that something about that letter. Uh, and out of that has come 10 years on uh, what is now happening. And I point out in due course, two people in the audience who are full time with the Western Front Way. So that was the origin. It's a Winchester home story, John. Thank you. And alongside that story um, is, is your own story, Anthony. And it's the interplay of the two that's so fascinating as well. Um, and you'd had a remarkably successful career, have, have and continue to but your time headmaster of uh, Brighton College, headmaster of, um, of Wellington College, uh, vice chancellor of Buckingham University, you know, all really good. And yet you write on page 10 here, um, as long as I was busy, I got by. The swirl of activity kept me from introspection, from confronting my demons. Fear had been my constant companion, fear of just about everything, fear of failure, fear that no one would want me, and now seemed to be the case. That's what you were bringing to this walk. So I wonder what you were looking for in undertaking this walk. I suggested to John that he asked me difficult questions. Um, uh, why did I do that? Um, can we have the easy ones first, please? No, I, seriously. My experience of life, uh, writing not the least about prime ministers. And the book on Boris Johnson is the seventh long book that I will have completed on uh, recently departed prime ministers, is that 
they and people around them and their cabinet ministers are often uh, blotting out um, their inner demons with activity. Uh, and I think that we all rush through with this and uh, many people self-medicate with alcohol or with tranquilizers or antidepressants or sleeping pills and then morphine in the final hours. And, you know, that's okay. Uh, who are we to judge? Um, but there is another way of learning to accept. And despite talking a, you know, a lot in my life about happiness and well-being and meditation and contemplation and mindfulness, uh, it, it wasn't wholly working for me. So setting out, you know, now um, the jobs, you know, the full-time jobs were, you know, perhaps uh, over um, and until what's happened recently. And suddenly, you know, you're confronted by the fact that for 25 years, I'd been looked after. It must be quite similar to being a bishop um, or being a commandant uh, in, in the army where, or being a diplomat, where, where you have lives uh, which are you know, really quite well looked after, where people do your laundry. I mean, so can I just share <laughs> a real insight with you? If you leave your clothes in the corner of your bedroom, they're still there uh, a couple of days later. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's astonishing. I mean, you know, like who would have thought? Um, a, and you are, you are. Um, so, you know, I've suddenly been confronted by all these things, and and uh, it's so. I always wanted to do a long walk. Thought about John Groats to Lands End. This seemed to be something very special. So it brought together my lifelong desire to confront myself with the opportunity to give this walk. Extra. I mean, it was doing well, but it, there was a chance that by my walking it, it could give it extra legs and, and a bit of extra publicity. So that was why I was on a pilgrimage on a journey. Are we just in brackets? Am I allowed to ask you about your current post or not? Saying? Yeah. Yes. Of okay. Course, yeah. Um, you've just taken on this week <clears throat> a rather demanding role. Um, could you just tell us what that is? So. Um, yes, uh, uh, about um, uh, almost exactly uh, three weeks ago, my oldest daughter messaged me just before, fatal to look at your phone before you go to sleep, and she said, Dad, there's some awful news, uh, and it was about a headmistress uh, and her seven-year-old daughter and her husband who were found dead at a school called Epsom College. Yeah, uh, uh, in, in the head's house. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, I think that would have particularly affected her. She's very sensitive anyway, but also she was brought up in a head's house. Um, and um, so, uh, and then a approval, uh, three or four days later, was it just two weeks ago? I can't remember. Um, it's also blurred. And, and uh, I got a phone uh, from the chair, actually from a Parent, someone we both knew and said, look, would you be interested in this? And I said, well, look, I'm always interested in doing anything that's going to help, that's going to help, you know. Mm. Uh, I, and so there we are. Anyway, I'm, I've, <coughs> I'm going to the school for the foreseeable future to uh, help that community heal, uh, move on, um, do good things, get the children, help get the children happy and, and, uh, and flourishing again and, and, and try and get a bit of perspective on it. I think it's a remarkable cho good choice, and thank you for taking it on. Um, mm. But it will be demanding, as was walking a thousand kilometres, uh, which was um, a thousand steps, and a thousand steps represented what, for every step you took, that was six people who were killed, was it, or ten people? Ten people who were killed on the Western Front for every step. That, um, that Anthony would take. It, it was a very demanding, you were, you were setting yourself something like 30 kilometers a day to begin with, weren't you? Um, it didn't always work out, um, but this is 30 kilometers, 18 miles, you know, something like that. That's a lot to do, particularly when you're 68 or 74. Um, you know, this is a lot of walking. And um, I'm amazed you didn't get lost, 
but your your feet sometimes got lost, didn't they? And you you found yourself in hospital with you got bitten by things and so on. Just tell us about some of the difficulties of walking this Western Front way. Very. Can I just say that what I said there about that school, I'm not um, I'm not talking at all to anybody about it. My first job is just to help the school settle. Um, so whatever I said there about it, um, if it can just remain in this room. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's not that. Uh, are there any long distance walkers here? Um, uh, how far is far? Um, is a very good question. Um, far, far is somewhere between enormously far and pretty far, I, I would say. Um, <laughs> It's not so much. I mean, by and large, we walk at about four or five kilometres an hour. Um, I mean, five is, is quite smart. Six is, is your heart rate's going, going right up. Um, and four is, to, is a nice pace. So if you're doing 30, that's seven and a half hours actual walking. It wasn't so much that that's difficult to do. When I was practicing, the longest walk John I did was from uh, from here to Salisbury along the Clarendon Way, and um, which is a, a very beautiful uh, one day walk. And Kim, who's in the audience, was there for uh, part of that, uh, all of it, part of it. Yeah, uh, and we'll talk. Uh, um, I'll introduce you to them later. But um, you know that was quite long. That is about I think twenty five miles. I mean, it, it, that was 10 hours walking. What, what is hard, John, is doing it day after day after day. Mm. And my idea was to have a, a, a rest day, a, 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 a um, Sabbath. Um, but, but I just didn't allow the time to do that. So it was day after day. And then if you think that you are, so it was a thousand kilometers, roughly a million steps, it's actually 1.25 million, according to my phone. And uh, through soil where, as you said, uh, 10 million either died or bled to death. Um, it, it was doing it cumulatively day after day. So that is, you know, that, that's one million uh, bits of friction on your feet, you know, all the time with no time to recover. And I, I've never had blisters ever in my life. Mm. I, I, you know, I, I, I've, led, I, I, I've led a, 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 a blister-free life. Are, um, and, and my goodness, once they come, they're really hard to deal with. There are very vivid descriptions about your blisters, if I may say. Yeah. Um, I, I felt for you because you, from an early stage, it seemed that the binding of your, <laughs> your blisters was tricky. But you did end up in hospital. You did end up with a, a, a dog bite, didn't you? You did end up with quite a lot of difficulty there. Sometimes, as I remember, you, you ended the day with a nice meal um, and bottles of wine and so on, nice discussions. But it got tougher as you went on. Did you ever think you'd give up? Um, wow. Well, um, so uh, yes. Um, so I was in hospital four times. I've hardly ever been, apart from going to hospital a great deal with Joanna, who had cancer, my wife. I've hard. Didn't think I've ever. Didn't think I've ever been to hospital for myself. Um, and so that was quite sudden. Uh, and. Uh, once was dehydration. Uh, once was um, uh, w w w once was a fear that I got septicemia, on, on because that's you know uh, th that's what a lot of these soldiers were dying from. Mm. And, and when you start reading all these soldiers, you start imagining that you've got these things yourself. And 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 and, and so they went very very red. Uh, and I use something called Compede, uh, which some of you will know if you're walkers, which is brilliant. Uh, until you have to pull it off, uh, and a lot of your skin comes off at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure that, that isn't the way you do it, but that's what happened with me anyway. And uh, then there was a dog. Now that's interesting because my predisposition, I mean, where I've made mistakes in life, it's often because I've trusted people too much, but I didn't regret that one bit. Um, slightly what happened at the University of Buckingham. And um, you, I'd much sooner trust people too much. Um, not, and so this dog. I, I was walking. I was. Uh, it was a beautiful part. It was near Verdun, uh, roughly halfway, and walking out of the town up into the hills. And I was thinking, this is very like the Lake District. Dry stone walls, um, 
a beautiful farmhouse. I thought, this is just great. Then this lovely dog started coming out, to, out towards me. Uh, I thought it was smiling. <laughs> um, and I quickly worked out that actually it wasn't smiling. Um, and I had nothing in my hand to sort of get away. And it just went whoomp, uh, straight and caught me there. Um, and I thought, that's not great. Um, and then I saw it, then it went, to, it hurried straight away and the farmer uh, immediately hauled it back. And I then thought, I'm going to have a word with that farmer. Um, then I thought, actually, my French, you know, um, uh, uh, and it's okay. Um, in a, in, it's okay in a hotel trying to order a, get a room. It's not bad in a restaurant. But I don't think that asking for him for um, a, 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 a glass of rosé would be, you know, quite quite the, the, the solution to his <laughs> dog. Um, and so, I, so <laughs> I then walked on, and then friends started saying, you know, you've got to get this checked out. So that, that was another time. That was a big decision then about to have um, whether to have a uh, ra the ra whole rabies thing uh, and. Yeah. There are a lot of a lot of personal stories here, which make it absolutely fascinating. Yes, it did, it did get more difficult, John, in answer to that question. Okay. Yeah. Notes to self: dogs don't smile. Okay. Um, right. Moving on. The this is part of your story, but the story you were walking alongside was this desperate story of uh, of the First World War, and you you turn up some what I found absolutely fascinating uh, facts, and I know you've been. What was it 30 times or 50 times? Can't remember taking groups to the the Western Front from various schools. But um, I and I've been a few times, but learned so much. Um, the fact that at certain space places the trenches were only 10 meters apart, that's incredibly close. The fact there were 1.5 billion shells used um, over these small distances um, where the war was fought. 400 tons of munitions turn up each year. Um, still, you know, being dug up from those those lands, and 600 people have been killed since um, the First World War, digging up the munitions that are still around there. And then this was a particular tragedy, Anthony. 707 of your own former Wellington lads, boys who'd been at Wellington College, uh, were killed. These are extraordinary facts. Who did all your research for you? Uh, so some I did myself, uh, some I did uh, with a young man who several books ago uh, came to me after university and just wanted to work on books and who has been brilliant in the book and a lot also came from the Western Front way and this Rory Forsyth, Kim Heyer here and um, for those who want to know more about it at the end of the talk, uh, can you just identify yourself, just wave. Uh, Kim and, and Rory uh, there um, so from the Western Front way. So really, John, a mixture of different sources. But although I have taken, can I just ask here, who has been out to the Western Front and seen the trenches? Um, it, is, it is something, so maybe a third, maybe more. It is a very wonderful thing to do. Mm. Uh, and it is, I think, it's not uh, morbid. Um, the Commonwealth War Grades, by the way, are very excited about this book because it, the walk, because it helps, it's renewing interest uh, in what happened. It's a very easy thing to do. It's just an hour's drive from Channel Ports. So um, finding out more about it was something, every time I go on those trips, mm. I learn more. And yet, John, I am stunned by how little... I know, and how much more there is to learn mm. about it. Well, you certainly give us uh, a lot more to chew on um, in this book. It's a, it's a brilliant way of actually introducing us to the, the Western Front. Um, but the Somme and Passchendaele uh, obviously are written into our souls in this country, aren't they? But they're only a very small part um, of that Western Front way, but very moving. Um, you were used to taking groups, as I say. Um, you, you, did you come closer this time to the realities of those, those places? So what was the effect on you this time? I know there's all the physical stuff and, and so on, but actually the experiencing the Western Front, 
Did you get something different out of it on this occasion? Yes, I, I did, because there's something about being on your own mm. that allows uh, experience to be different and in some ways, but not every way, deeper. And I was, um, Rory joined me for part of it, Sarah, my new wife, um, who I've married since writing that book, mm. uh, was there at the beginning, but I was mostly on my own. It was, it was the intensity and the relentless nature of the experience of being in uh, or near the front line all the time and passing so many uh, cemeteries, um, which oddly I always find uplifting, um, while also being deeply sad. Um, one thing I learned, by the way, going through grief is there's the world difference between grief and depression. Um, and so, uh, yes, I was learning. It, it was a deeper experience. And also, if you're not having to think, OK, we've got to, we're going to be arriving at this new destination in 12 minutes. I've got you know, this amount of time to get through this amount of information for people on the minibus or the, or the coach. It, 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 it's, it's lovely taking people in groups. But it means that you are you know, you're a courier and, and your, your brain is going all the time. It, it, you can't quite, in the same personal way, but the reactions of those who are on it and encouraging people on trips that I take to write their own poetry or make their own drawings and, and to be creative themselves as well as to read out extracts from their own family's experience or from passages of novels or... Or, or, or histories, or letters, or poems, so that uh, there can be a deeper experience than merely knowing that um, this platoon happened to fight here and lost 17 people on, you know, bits. Yeah. And sometimes you would find a, uh, a particular grave. Would, would you go and, did you go and search out a particular grave where, you know, a poet perhaps had been killed, or where a particular VC had been one nearby or something. Did you yes. do that, or perhaps that not on this occasion? I, well, I did, yes. And so um, just for those apologies to those who know all this, but the line is roughly five, 600 miles long, the Western Front. The top bit of it, nearest the North Sea, some 30 miles, was overseen by the Belgians, and they flooded it. Um, so that the Germans couldn't get through. Then the next bit down, um, so maybe the Belgians had roughly 5%, then maybe the next 25% the British had, and the remainder of the 70% was overseen by the French. So that's why Verdun is in the French sector. The British sector, on the British sector, the most intense fighting were in the very places you mentioned uh, of the Somme and, uh, uh, and Passchendaele. So those are the places where um, I went um, and go to mostly with British audiences because, um, but because uh, that, that's where the families are, are. And two particular places, there was somebody called Ronnie Poulton Palmer, who was a Christian, uh, and he's at Bailey College, Oxford. Uh, he was from the Huntley and Palmer family of biscuits, Reading. Um, and he was also captain of England rugby, uh, an extraordinary player. Mm. And so his grave is just south of Armentier, not that far from where Gillespie was killed. And then um, just south of the town, beautiful town of Arras, there's a grave of a poet who was very close to Robert Frost, the poet, American poet. Mm. Uh, called Edward Thomas, and mm. uh, th that was very special, you know, partly for personally because my wife, Joanna, loved Edward Thomas, and when we would go, she would always read poems by his grave, mm. uh, and he, he wrote two four-liners called Cherry Trees and In Memoriam, and there is a cherry tree there shedding its blossom at, at, at the right time of year, which is what he talks about in the poem, and there's something very special about it. I remember being at university very moved by the memoir that his wife wrote called As It Was and World Without End, uh, quite short, published by Faber, 
and about his life uh, and also about, anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> uh, the last time uh, that he went off from Hampshire, quite close here to the front, uh, to go off and fight that last time in 1917. Uh, and then he was killed on the first day of the Battle of Arras on the 9th of April, uh, 1917. So, sorry, lots of, of um, illustrations you could give here, but, but the, actually you had your own personal investment uh, in this in another way, didn't you? Because your grandfather, Wilfred, um, just, just tell us a bit about... So uh, he uh, married... Um, a, he married this beautiful Scots lady called Eileen Stenhouse, and uh, he was in trade uh, and was felt to be way below um, uh, the, 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 this stately family, the Stenhouses. So they married illicitly and went off to fight, and he was training to be a doctor. Uh, and his, one of his men was shot at Ypres, just south of Ypres, in a place called Plug Street Wood, Plug Sturt, where Winston Churchill went to fight. And uh, he was shot on the head when he was, he had only had the first year of his medical training, but he was uh, crouched over the soldier who survived and, and lived a long time. And when he was crouching over, a bullet hit him in the head. Uh, and she had this intuition, intimation that he was going to die, and she badgered the war office to get passage to go over to France to bring him back to nurse him, and she did, uh, and he survived. It's called Wilfred and Eileen. It became a, uh, it became a, a novel, and it became a BBC One television series. So, you know, that's you know, point is that we all of us in this room will have family histories connected with <coughs> World War One, and all of us will be slightly different people because of what happened in that war that finished 104 years ago. Mm. Yes, so lots of personal investment here. But um, for you, going through this experience, Anthony, I know um, your faith uh, was important to you. There are many references to the times of your uh, times of meditation, contemplation, um, daily uh, routines, not routines, uh, important actions, um, time spent with, uh, um, with yoga. You, know, you, you draw on a, you have a wonderfully eclectic um, uh, array of gifts to bring spiritually to this uh, task of walking a thousand kilometers. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, how did your, your faith sustain you, uh, your faith practice, I mean, the things you were doing? Well, uh, immensely, and um, so um, I, I have had quite a broad uh, theological experience. My father was Jewish, the family came from Ukraine, which was another uh, dimension which you might um, want to pick up on, uh, and so I was very aware of that, and there's a story about what happened to them and, and my mother's side uh, with this family, the Willits, Wilfred and Eileen. And um, so that was a mixed um, heritage. And I married Joanna, a girl I met at university on plays, fell in love with her. And uh, we were married by, uh, by somebody who'd been through Auschwitz called Hugo Grin, who was, some of you will know Hugo Grin, <coughs> who did a lot in Council of Christians and Jews. Mm. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I mean, just an, an amazing human being. And um, so, uh, but I never felt I was leaving Christianity despite the fact I was going to uh, Judaism. And Judaism is, is a, a, a wonderful, powerful uh, faith. And of course, Christ was uh, a Jew uh, uh, and lived his life, um, was brought up uh, as, as a Jew. But, but, um, uh, Sarah is a practicing Christian. I, I have so my life, my 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 church life is 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 much more now conventional church. But I also have always meditated ever since I left university, and now I use the uh, word uh, which I talk about in the book 
which is an extraordinary word, uh, which I say, repeat, ideally 30 minutes every morning and evening. And it takes you into a place uh, of, of extraordinary, um, it's uh, of extraordinary unity um, and acceptance and wholeness. Uh, it's it's and Maranatha. Indeed, you, and it's yeah. Maranatha. Wow. And indeed, you can't, you can't hear it without being there. I mean, it, it is an extraordinary word. I mean, it's not the only one, obviously. Um, and, and that's just the way that I'm built. And, and we all, you know, we can't all fit, I don't think, into one particular uh, church tradition. And so that, that that is for me, and that's what I was doing then, John. And it, sometimes it, it, um, it it's much more powerful than others. But it certainly was really helpful to you, and and yoga too. So you kept going with that diet. Now you also give us lots in this book. Uh, I mean, I I think you've got the impression I'm really keen on it, but lots of. Um, little personal details that come through that uh, thank you for being brave enough to share them really in, as you write. For instance, um, I've got some things on page 186, 187, somewhere around there. Um, here you say, yes, I don't think that death is the end, but I do wish I could discern more about what follows it. <laughs> Good question. Um, here's another. So many friendships, so many families miss out on joy through pettiness. I am as guilty as the next person, aren't we all? Um, here again, near the end of the book, I've always hated saying goodbye and feel deep pain at rejection and loss in any form, as in young love or as with the loss of Joanna, inconsolable grief creeping up and all but overwhelming me when least expecting it. This acute vulnerability will always be part of me, and so on. So you give us a lot of yourself here. This was... Is it just the way you write, um, or, did, or did this book, writing this book, as opposed to writing about Boris or whatever, you know, draw out different things in your own writing style? Well, it's very interesting, John. A and um, those words um, are absolutely right. I mean, you know, I, I think our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses are our greatest assets mm -hmm. uh, and our greatest sources of hope it, 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 it's the it, it's the, uh, the the laboratory the table on which we can work um, and turning those into something that we can learn to accept about our uh, ourselves um, you know, loss you know, always um, it is it is I mean I remember I had a girlfriend at university and she said, she said many things, actually. But one of, them was, uh, one of them was, I can't have a conversation with someone on a train without them being sad when it's over, because I just think where that relationship could have gone. And, <laughs> um, and, and, and if you have the kind of life that I have, where you are masses of children, masses of parents, I've been in five schools, now six, um, one university, lots of different things. Um, well, one thing I do believe, which will seem outrageous, is is that the word thinking isn't enormously helpful because we'll never think our way into faith. Faith is quintessentially a non-rational process. It's the thinking mind. We can think up arguments for why God exists. We can think up arguments why God doesn't exist, actually it's just a lot of, uh, uh, of blowing in the wind. Um, the experience is so far beyond thought. Hmm. Um, it, it is knowing uh, as opposed to thinking. Uh, therefore, when I say that about death, it, well, I'll never be able to think what happens beyond death because it isn't a thinking experience. In some ways, we are already dead, and we will die in this moment now, and we were born in this moment now. And in the same way that, as Eliot talks about, we live in, there is just uh, the present moment. Uh, there is just the one presence. And I have this un often uh, unnerving, but it's not really unnerving, it's quite comforting sense 
there's someone talking on the other side of the room, and it's, you know it's just you. It's just the same uh, spirit that is just. I mean, if God exists, and I believe God exists, uh, then God is everywhere, and God is in all of us, mm. uh, and it is the same. Uh, and, and these senses, these apprehensions, these intimations of a totally different world can be helped in the same way by fasting. I think fasting, we, we lose to our loss in society, but also putting oneself through uh, endurance episodes uh, uh, help to get us into those places. I, I kind of, and, and in 10 seconds, I promise, I, don't write, I haven't written a book for 20 years. I dictate everything. And therefore, I find that I'm, because I'm a talker, a, a teacher, um, and I find it easier to not to have to write sentences. Then when it comes out in print, I can then come back and, and, and make it into something more fluent. Mm. Um, Anthony, thank you. Just as you were speaking, and I was just thinking of um, you know, the presence of God always and everywhere and in us. It was Thomas Merton, wasn't it, who said, uh, uh, God is at home. It's we who've gone out for a walk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, absolutely, the presence of God. Um, I'm going, I'd like to do, uh, use the rest of our time in this way. Um, I want to ask you one question. The question will be, what did you learn about yourself from doing all this? Then I want to throw it open for, to invite questions from others. And then I'd like to close with where we are on the Western Front way now, um, you know, where we've got to and where the progress is, and uh, perhaps we'll be calling in your, your good Brilliant friends then. Yeah. Um, but let me just ask you then this, this question. Uh, you know, what did this, what do you learn about yourself from undertaking this, um, this mighty task? So, I, I was afraid of failing, John. I was afraid of not doing, uh, not, all my life, there's a voice in my head that says, you're not going to be able to do this. <laughs> um, I remember when I first became a teacher and stood up on stage in front of, uh, the children on assembly, I, I, my knees were knocking and, and these voices were raging saying, you, you're going to fail, you're going to muck it up. Uh, and so, um, you know, some people, not a lot maybe, have that sense of, of self-attack um, and you have to let it be because you can't argue, you have to love that which is doing within you, those uh, part of you that is saying that. But I was afraid of not finishing it and it did drive me on. I think I've learned that I have more to find out um, and more to forgive and uh, that this walk is over, this walk is over, but my walk in life is not over. Mm. Um, Thank you. As a, as a succinct answer, that's, um, that's very helpful indeed. Thank you. Um, we could turn back to the Ukraine one as well, thank you. But let me just open this up. Uh, we've got some roving mics here, um, and you may, I hope, have uh, questions you'd like to ask rather, rather than just mine. Could you just put up a hand, and then uh, I've got one at the front here, one back there. Um, is, is, there is there only one mic around? Okay. Um, well, it's coming down on this side. And could you just put up your hand again, whoever? Thank you. In the red pullover. As they say. Oh right, okay, yeah, technology. Um, while we're Hello? getting Hello? that, yeah. so, no, here we are. Okay, down three, and then along. That's it. That's your right place. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your talk and for undertaking the walk and writing the book, uh, which is wonderful. I, I wondered when I finished the book, um, you you focus on the walk very much on uh, one side in the conflict um, over, over the other, uh, so on the French experience and the American experience, Commonwealth and the Belgium experience, uh, more than the, the German experience. And I was wondering um, to what extent it's possible when it comes to the First World War that um, we can metaphorically walk no man's land be between the two sides um, in, in, in any conflict or in, or in that conflict specifically, and to what extent is it, if you can, is, is that, the, is that the, the path to peace? 
So, so just help me a bit with the question. Do you mean physically, to what extent physically can one walk in no man's land, or to what extent can one uh, emotionally ever walk in between two combatants? Yeah, uh, so yes, the latter, but I suppose you could answer the former as well. Can you do it physically? But, but it's, more, it's, it's more the kind of metaphorical, can, can we walk in no man's land? It seemed in the, in the book you were kind of searching for that path for peace and, and trying to find what peace is and how well, you get uh, there. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, a core question in the war uh, is, sorry, in the book is, is, what is peace? I mean, clearly we in this country are not at war, but uh, uh, we are not at peace either. Peace came at... 11 a.m. on the 11th of November 1918, but peace clearly didn't come because many people, um, including your relatives, will have had the war raging in their heads probably till the day that they died and waking up with memories and cold sweats or they had lost limbs uh, and or they'd lost the ability to, to, to work. Uh, or they'd lost the people they loved most in life and couldn't find it difficult to lead, lead a complete life. So, so peace, what is peace? Peace has to be about much more than the absence of war. And I believe, but I can't persuade anybody of it, that peace is only available in uh, spiritual wholeness and in a total acceptance of oneself and other people. Uh, and that... Uh, inclines one towards a position of standing uh, aside from combatants. So if there are two people fighting in the street uh, without getting punched up oneself, one would be wanting to try and bring stop them happening rather than joining in on one side or the other. Now, there are wars like the Second World War where there clearly was evil, or as is the case with Putin, I believe, at the moment, um, there clearly is right overwhelmingly on one side. I don't believe that that was the case in the First World War. The First World War was a battle between imperial powers that felt insecure about the preservation of their own um, economic, military, political might uh, and were fighting at the, the most grievous of wars. It's hard to see that either side had more moral right on them, uh, the Turks, the Austro-Hungarians, the Russians. Um, and so our position is always to be the still center uh, and to, to try to help people to find that. So I think the idea of the path of peace is extraordinarily uh, pertinent and timely, as timely as when Gillespie uh, dreamt it up 110 years ago, but it's up to all of us to find out what it means in our own lives, and therefore we can enact it. So whether we're cycling it or walking it, uh, we will be bringing our own thing to it. That, look, that's such a big question you're asking. I've, I've, just a quick answer. Can we have a, a, another question down here, please? Um, third row. And... Thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, your book is set mainly in France. Uh, what do you think uh, we could be doing to improve relations of our, with our close neighbour, with France? Yeah, uh, well, um, I, I'm not going to mention the B word um, <laughs> because um, it's always divisive. And so we are where we are. I had lunch with a lot of uh, young people, 18-year-olds, and we were talking about it at lunch. And like most young people, they want to be back a, a, a part of the, the, the economic European community, but that's not going to happen, may not happen in their lifetimes. Um, clearly finding points of, in, uh, of common interest... Uh, we've had an interesting relationship with France, haven't we, we could say, uh, in the last thousand and more years. And it's often been, as you know, not a very friendly relationship. Um, and we, um, w w if there's something we can fight about, we will fight about it. 
Mm. Uh, uh, and now we're doing so in more acceptable ways over football and, and rugby. Um, but uh, I, I think in every way, trying to reach out to France. Uh, I, 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 we're, my family are, uh, are Francophiles. In the last year of Joanna's life, I took her on a mystery tour uh, down to a place just by the Dordogne where we'd been on our honeymoon 35 years before. And there was just somewhere for sale, ridiculously cheaply, as houses are in France, uh, by a river and bought it, and that's where her ashes are. I mean, for me, for my family, we, we feel very much part of France. I, I think that it, it's important that that not just with the French, but with, with everybody. We are open and inclusive as a nation, and we keep the tolerance that we have. Uh, because what's the alternative? Reach out and find points of contact. Thank you. Um, another question? It has to be, we're getting near the yeah, end. Yeah, I'll, I'll be much quicker. Uh, um, uh, much, much quicker from now on. How long have we got? Uh, we've only got five minutes. Anyway, well, 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 right. right. Uh, we're going to... Um, I want to talk about... Uh, uh, about uh, where we are now with the... Where we are now. Can, can we bring that one in? Yep. Uh, where we are, are we now with the Western Front Way? Uh, Rory uh, or Kim, I just want to just give a 30-second hit. Uh, in fact, you both stand up together. We, we, we can hear it. Well, that's right. voices. Hi, everyone. It's, it will be 30 seconds. Um, Anthony, thank you for everything you've done. Where we are at, uh, Belgium is fully marked. So you can follow 600 of our markers. We have an app which came out in November. The next version is coming out in a couple of weeks. That's got all the stories, all the history, all the content, all the poems. Uh, so it's a much broader understanding. You know, our logo has the four flowers of commemoration of Germany, Belgium, France, and the Commonwealth, all about inclusivity. You asked about what we could do with France and Britain. Getting this to happen and getting it fully marked hey, is a brilliant yeah. mm. But Anthony, last word. That's a true pilgrim right there. A thousand kilometers on his own. Quite unbelievable. So we've got, um, uh, Rob, can I just ask the um, Belgium very keen. Um, French communes get it? Yes, they definitely get it. There is a, there's a hiking route and a cycling route. They're slightly different. But they're all agreed. All the communes are on board. We're supported by the French Ministry of Defence. All the mayors are behind it, regions, departments. So it's mm. looking good, basically. I mean, what, what's there not to like about it for them? It's great for culture, great for history, great for the economy, great to revivify all those Café de la Paix and Hotels de la Paix that were all put up in the 1920s for the pilgrims coming over and visiting. I mean, it's a win-win, it's a mm. um, and it's something we can share. Mm. What then, Anthony, is, would be your message to us um, out of your experience? What would you, you know, we'll, we'll go away from here having said that was a really thoughtful, interesting um, uh, talk that you gave and we've learnt a lot, etc. But what would you want the mess, your message to us from your experience to be to go and do or be different? Well, uh, we can always be more than we think we are. And we define ourselves often by saying we can't do that or I can't walk uh, this far or I would like to do it. Um, it is a question of making time for what deeply matters in our lives. Uh, as that quotation, John, that you read out, um, it, it, we can get lost in the trivia, in the bickering, in the petty, uh, it, 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 the, the nobility of our lives, our ability, whatever ages we are, uh, to do more, to reach out more, to touch more people's lives is enormous. Uh, and it's also energy giving and it is deeply affirming. So we can, all of us, every single person in the auditorium, me included, uh, can be doing more to, uh, to, 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 to be more what we're on earth to do. Uh, and th that, I think, is, is uh, the message. Now, that may be walking or cycling, as Rory was saying, part of uh, this path. It may be doing something completely different, but go for it. That is the path of life. This is the path of life. And for it's you, about living and living more deeply and more truly. And for you, and part fully. of for you, part of that is going to be taking the walk on towards Ukraine. Would you just say a word about that? 
Well, um, so uh, once this is now being embedded by Rory and Kim, this summer I would have gone on from kilometre zero, then up the Rhine Valley, then through Bavaria, through old West Germany, out through East Germany, into Poland and finishing uh, in Katowice, Krakow and Auschwitz. Um, uh, and then the following year, I was then going to go on to the Ukrainian mm. uh, small market town where my family came from. And um, yeah, you know, uh, that's, that, that, that's part of my life. Um, and I hope to be able to do that. But well, first, uh, there's a job to do at Epsom College, isn't there? So. Uh, and first, my immediate job is, is uh, Epsom, and it's we're launching a commission on Downing Street next week, which I've taken because Downing Street is such a mess, and, and we need to have a much better centre of British government. Um, uh, th there's a lot, you know. Th we all, but the you know, most important to me is actually being a dad. Uh, I have three children, uh, uh, and being a husband, John. I, you know, I'm now a husband, and, and I have learned, and I get daily reminded that my clothes in the corner of the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point to uh, to end with, um, Anthony. Thank you so much for giving us uh, so much of yourself um, and the experience and um, and the Western Front itself. Um, I've enormously enjoyed this book. <clears throat> do want people to read it. Um, so do take the opportunity to go and, and buy this signed edition, um, worth an awful lot more uh, because uh, you've got this uh, signature of the famous person who helped to heal Epson College, but did so much more in his life. Anthony, thank you so much. Let's give him a round of applause.